I, uh, it's very important that I mention um, I am just one of the PMs at Google uh, working on uh, Kubernetes. And um, in specific, you know, it's not a Google-driven project. So we have a brand new, uh, not brand new anymore, about three months old, uh, Kubernetes PM group. Uh, and we use that to um, help drive the product. So it's very much not a Google-driven thing. Uh, I contribute uh, along with the other Google PMs. Uh, but really, we want this to be a Kubernetes or an open source project um, and, and to have the vision and the roadmap delivered from there. So, uh, without further ado, um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about Kubernetes 1.4, which came out um, uh, just about six weeks ago. <clears throat> Kubernetes 1.5 coming out in just about a month. So, uh, it, you know, this is one of my favorite graphs. I, <clears throat> I show it at almost every conference because it shows the pace of the uh, innovation here. Um, and, and the regularity with which new things come out. And, and that really is a credit to the people who are here in this room and watching over the live stream and couldn't care less about watching KubeCon at all, uh, the ones who actually are out there doing the work. As you saw in uh, Ken Goldberg's uh, presentation during the keynote, uh, more than 50% of people making this line go up and to the right um, are not Googlers. And, and that is something we are extremely excited about. Uh, as I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me. Kubernetes um, 1.4 came out uh, just there at, at the uh, end of October. Uh, and you can see just a few of the highlights that we have here around Kubernetes. Um, you know, over 5,000 commits in Kubernetes 1.4 uh, with another 25% incremental um, uh, contributors, top 0.01% of GitHub projects, and over 2,500 external projects based on Kubernetes. Uh, and that really is because of the people there in the middle, and those are just a small subset of the, the uh, folks uh, contributing, and then companies using. Uh, at last count, something like five out of the top 15 websites in the world use Kubernetes either in whole or in part. Um, and uh, that's something we're really, really excited about. Uh, and, you know, I, I love revisiting this slide. I've been presenting this particular statement for over a year and a half at this point. Uh, and it, it still remains our vision. Uh, there's a great an uh, anecdote. When you come to Google, uh, before things like Kubernetes and things like that, you were, you were unproductive for six months because you were learning entirely new ways of building distributed systems. And, and that's something that we want to uh, really transform about building distributed systems in the world. And, and that's why this vision is so important to us. We want to bring it to everyone and use the 15 years of experience we have building it and the years of experience with Red Hat and IBM and all these other folks who contributed to the project to make it easier to build distributed systems in the wild. OK. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, uh, let's get into Kubernetes 1.4. Uh, there are many features in Kubernetes 1.4. I'm going to highlight just a few of them uh, that I think are particularly compelling. But you can go and see an entire list of them in the Kubernetes PM group, in our documentation, uh, or just mail me, and I'm happy to talk to them about, about them then. Um, there are three big ones that I want to call out, as I mentioned. Uh, the first is uh, improvements around setup and management, um, particularly not just the setup of the individual master and the nodes, but even the network itself. Uh, we have rich cross-cluster federation. Um, that, that really enable you to, to deploy applications across multiple clouds in a very straightforward way. Uh, and then a much uh, improved simpli uh, simplified installation for applications. You know, basically, great, I now have a cluster. What do I do next? So let me walk you through this. Um, who has heard that setting up a Kubernetes cluster is hard? All right. The, re the rest of you are liars. Um, this is a known thing. It was very much our, it, it was our intent to build the building blocks, to get it out there, make it easy to, to or excuse me, make it very powerful. Um, but we knew that we were going to come back to focus on some of the user experience to getting things up and running uh, shortly. There, there are some solutions today. If you're, if you're going down kind of the straight and narrow path, you can use KubeUp, which is a script that handles things uh, very easily. Um, if you want to get more complicated, you can compile your own from head, but that's a lot of things to take on yourself. Or you can use a lot of the third-party applications. And there are many great ones out there. Um, you know, uh, Cube, uh, Cube AWS from CoreOS, COPS, which is a community-driven project, and many other ones uh, do make it easy to do. But we think that's a failure mode, that much of the system being set up by a third-party application 
you know, should, should require a third party application to get up and running. We really want to make this part of the core. So, uh, we have a brand new project that launched to alpha in Kubernetes 1.4. It's called kubeadm. Uh, this is going to be one of those things that people debate how it's pronounced, of course. Kubeadm, kubeadm, I don't know. Uh, I should take a show of hands to see how people pronounce kubectl, uh, but I guess we'll see. Um, so, kubeadm. Uh, first, every component to Kubernetes is packaged. So you can, from your favorite repo, get a package. This is what that looks like, literally, to get it up and running. Uh, you type that package, it installs it. Then, on your master node, you type kubeadm init, and you have a cluster. That's it. Seriously. Uh, the nice part is the last line of that cluster, cube join and a token, you go to a node. That already has the packages installed, assume. Uh, or I show you doing it there. You type cube join, it even gives you the IP address. Presto, you now have a two node cluster. That's it. <laughs> and then finally, uh, I mentioned about um, overlay networks and networking. Uh, many folks, if, if you're running in a cloud, Google Cloud, AWS, things like that, um, a lot of this stuff is taken care of for you. However, many who deploy on-premises or across multiple clouds might run into challenges um, because their networking topologies are more complex than just flat networks. Um, an overlay network is a great solution for that. In Kubernetes 1.4, we have the uh, brand new CNI interface, and anyone who subscribes to that interface uh, can use that for deploying nodes. This is an example from Weaveworks, uh, but anyone, uh, any network provider who um, uses this can do it. Uh, and you literally type that command, and presto, you now have an overlay node via daemon sets, so uh, connecting all your nodes together. So very, very powerful stuff. Um, let's do a demo. So unfortunately, I had to record the demo. I have a very short amount of time, and some of these steps require fast forwarding, not because they're hard, but because uh, it does take some time for things to get going. So in the upper left here, this will be my master on the left-hand side. Uh, these two will be nodes. Um, we'll get them going. As I said there, you type cube at a minute. Now that's a little bit high. Can you see that? Off you go. Uh, it does some commands, does some output that I didn't uh, print out earlier, and that's it. That, that really was it. I didn't have any steps in between there. It takes a little bit longer, uh, as I mentioned. If I had time there, you could see it. But that's it. Your master is done. You then grab that last token there, as I said. And I'm going to copy it over to these two other things. And off they go. Uh, those nodes are being set up as we speak right now. Um, uh, and then I'm just going to show you uh, those nodes. They, like I said, they usually take uh, just a few seconds to get going. Uh, if I do the watch API, you can see them come up. Uh, and then there are. So about 15, 10 to 15 seconds, uh, and your nodes are live and join the cluster. Uh, I mentioned about the daemon set uh, uh, networking across all of this. Uh, what it does is it deploys pods uh, that subscribe to your, or that use your daemon set, or um, your net overlay network provider. Uh, a daemon set deploys one and only one pod to every node, and so that can uh, provide your overlay network. Uh, this is using Weave, as I mentioned. Uh, I, I uh, enter it. The, the, it's been created. Uh, and then I'll show you in the watch here. You can see at the bottom uh, those three pods, one for each of the nodes in the system, have been created and deployed to their appropriate uh, spots. So that, that really is it. Um, that is our goal with Kubernetes, um, our kubeadm, to make setting up and using a cluster very, very easy. OK. Normally, I'd have to stop for questions here, but I have zero time, so I will continue on. Um, second, uh, cross-cluster federation. So uh, this is one of the most requested features. Um, people don't want to deploy to single zones. They don't want to deploy to even single clouds anymore. They would really like to deploy in ways that make sense for their business needs. Uh, you may have geographic requirements uh, related to data locality. Uh, you may have... Um, uh, geographic requirements related to latency. Maybe you have many users in Europe, many users in Asia, and you want to have um, uh, applications to, out to those various places. Uh, those are easy to get started, right? You could just spin up a cluster in each one, but then you've developed a whole, you have to develop a whole new management layer on top of that to coordinate your applications between these. 
Um, and that's not ideal, uh, ripe, ripe for uh, opportunity for a problem. So this is, might be how you do it. Uh, as I said here, these are three examples, USA and Asia with various um, applications in each. And so you might individually deploy to each one of those. Uh, then you would deploy a service to each one separately. Um, and then on top of that, you might have a global load balancer, but the global load balancer would be decoupled from the services that you created, giving you yet another management headache that you have to keep up to speed. So the solution is to use uh, cross-cluster replication and, uh, or excuse me, federated uh, replication controllers and ingress. And by doing this, what you do is first, you deploy in one of the clusters, multi uh, federated, federated API masters will become shortly, becoming shortly, right now it's just in one. You deploy in one a federation master and you join all those clusters to that federated master. And then that's what you interact with in order to deploy these things. So for example, uh, you might have an application like that up there uh, that you've described. You hand that to the API master and it takes care of rolling out to all the uh, items in that federated cluster. Similarly, with a service, you would roll that out to the service, and it would deploy to all those individual clusters. And then that global load balancer through um, a federated ingress would be kept in sync with those clusters as they are outstanding. Then let's say you wanted to do a rolling deployment across those clusters. Uh, you would hand that to the federation API master, and it would take care of it for you, still keeping that global load balancer in sync. So, uh, let's do a quick demo on that. So here I just have a, a very, very simple demo. It's uh, the guestbook demo, basically a text box and a blue um, banner at the top. Uh, I've already set up uh, three clusters, one in uh, Europe, in Frankfurt, one in, uh, another one in Europe, in the UK, and one in the US. Um, uh, you can see the three clusters there, and I'll just show you really quickly this third one, this service. Uh, oh, I, I uh, skipped that. Uh, the service is just very, very straightforward. It doesn't even understand what clusters it's being deployed to right now. Uh, but I'm going to roll it out. I'm going to apply that service and roll it out to the public. Uh, and once it's rolled out, uh, I then bring, I'm going to bring up a uh, public endpoint. And I don't know, you can read it up there. That's a public endpoint that doesn't specify exactly where it is. So if I access this, I'm going to use incognito mode so it's not cached, you can see up there, randomly, it chose across all of these various clusters uh, one of the pods, in this case, it was the one deployed in Germany. Uh, oh, and then when I access it again, I open a new incognito window, hit the same load balancer, I'm redirected, and automatically goes forward. Again, that was not in my Kubernetes manifest, it was not in the service manifest, it just rolled out uh, by itself. So then, following up with that, um, now, so I have my application out there. It's running uh, eight pods spread across these clusters. Uh, now let's say I want to do an update. Well, I could do a rolling update where I destroy one and create another one. Uh, but another com very common deployment pattern is blue-green, <clears throat> blue-green, where you might have one set of nodes that are deployed or one set of pods that are deployed and a second set that, that basically come up simultaneously to make sure that the new one is operating properly in, uh, according, um, uh, as it comes up. So I'll do that here. I'm gonna roll out the green one simultaneously. Yes, there you go. Uh, and that green one is deploying, and as it deploys, it comes out, and it, it came up very, very quickly. And then when I go out and access that uh, in, in the wild, I'm getting 50, oop, I went forward a little quickly there. Um, it accessed it and it showed up with a green one 50-50. Uh, and then once I make sure it's up and running and operating properly, I can scale the previous one down to zero. So again, you didn't see me at any point there specify a specific cluster, uh, <clears throat> even understand the fact that this was rolling out in this way. I simply dictated according to my application, its requirements, and it was able to scale out. Uh, very, very powerful and in fact, probably even a little bit better than we do things today at Google uh, where it, it requires quite a bit of manual interaction in order to get that right. So, 20 minutes is a very short amount of time. Um, all right, final one, let me talk about Helm, um, uh, or excuse me, rolling out new applications. Today, um, when you roll out an application to Kubernetes, uh, at best, maybe you grab a Docker container, you have to think about the services and all those various things. 
uh, you might scratch your head and say, well, there's got to be a better way. Someone must have done this before. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what we've decided to do. So uh, with the community help, particularly led by Deus, um, we have a brand new package manager specifically for Kubernetes called Helm. Helm is made up of Helm, the package manager, and then a series of charts. Uh, whenever you hear packages in Linux, think the analog is charts. So with that, you say Helm init, and then you deploy, uh, for example, MariahDB, it looks like this. You deploy Jenkins, it looks like this. You deploy MySQL, it looks like this. Uh, and these are the basics, right? Obviously, there are plenty of ways to configure this, but you can be sure that this is going to be useful uh, straight out of the box, tested by the community, contributed by the community. Uh, we'll try and get through this. This is a complicated demo, but I'm going to show you nonetheless. So in this one, um, I am going to actually deploy in a way that, that makes me understand what my underlying uh, cluster federation looks like, and for, that's for a very specific reason. In this case, I'm going to do PostgreSQL. Uh, and so this, uh, we're, I'm going to deploy it in a high availability configuration where one zone has a master and then a second zone has two replicas associated with it. In this case, I want to deploy one to uh, my Postgres master to London, uh, and I type helm install. I give it an uh, instruction like um, uh, London to deploy it to, and that's it. That's it. Postgres now up and running. Then let's say I want to deploy uh, those uh, replicas of the Kubernetes master, or excuse me, of the Postgres master. In this case, you can see the power of Helm because I'm not just passing in the, the uh, context of the federation that I want to deploy to, but I'm actually passing in a startup uh, variable, in this case, the master pod IP. Uh, now, in this, in this particular case, there's a little bit of magic going on here because uh, normally your Kubernetes clusters wouldn't have a common IP pool to derive from. Because we were using Weave from that first example, you have a global address space that you can pull from, and that's how these replicas saw it. But you could easily handle that in, in myriad other ways. Uh, just to show you that is, in fact, what happens. This is a, a product by Weave called Weave Scope, and you can see there the three clusters are now up and running. And then when I go here to show you that this is uh, actually useful, this is the guestbook example that has been augmented to use the local Postgres for that particular um, cluster. Uh, in this case, I'm going to start typing things in this box. Uh, hello, KubeCon, isn't this amazing? These are stored locally, but because this is a, a master replica uh, replicated service, when I reload this, in fact, when I actually type in, I'm going to force going to the uh, Germany cluster here. You can see there at the top, I've swapped out and gone to a different cluster, and yet those, um, those replicated services, or excuse me, that replicated data has flowed through. So cluster up and running, working properly, all using Helm. All right. Uh, and then what would, what would uh, demo be without a UI? I will not show you a UI. I will show a screenshot of the new UI. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, the new UI. It's great. Uh, it has uh, really cool things like being able to see aggregated memory and CPU usage across a given application, uh, as well as over 90% of all the objects in the system are available via the, U, uh, the UI. So that's Kubernetes 1.4, just a small subset of the features. Uh, I have very little amount of time, so I'm going to go quickly here. But what's next? Uh, we're going to continue to advance along uh, deployment and management. Uh, we want to make a bunch of investments around non-disruptive system uh, maintenance. Uh, we want to move Kubeatom to beta, uh, which is currently on track, as well as making uh, setting up of those clusters, uh, those federated clusters, very, very easy. Uh, we're also going to uh, continue to advance along the um, uh, stateful applications and uh, far more charts. Uh, we're already up to 17 charts, uh, and our goal is you know, to get to all of your most common applications uh, to be deployable via that package manager. Uh, and then finally, more federated clusters. Uh, not every object is available yet. Uh, daemon sets and deployments are not available, as well as cluster-level uh, cluster metric scheduling. And with 20 seconds, I was very close. Uh, I suppose there's no time for questions. Anything? One question? 13 seconds? Anything? All right. Thank you very much.